All right, let's get this started. Good evening, everyone, and those of you joining us from the West Coast, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. On behalf of Executive Director Jen Ainsworth, the National Wild One staff in Nina, Wisconsin, our honorary directors and the Wild Ones Board of Directors, we are excited to welcome you to tonight's webinar. I am your host, Sally Wenzel, president of the National Board of Directors, a Tennessee Valley chapter member uh, and a lifetime member of Wild Ones. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. We have 73 chapters in 21 states. If there is not a chapter in your state, please think about starting one. And we have friendly staff here who are there to help you. Uh, tonight's presentation will feature Dr. Doug Tallamy, author, uh, entomologist, professor at University of Delaware, and Wild One's Lifetime Honorary Director. When I asked Dr. Tallamy if I could say he was a birder, he was all aw shucks. I said, can I say you like to take photos of birds? And he said that would, that would do. A lot of the photos you'll see tonight, I believe he has taken them, so I consider him a fantastic nature photographer. Uh, Dr. Talmy has written several books, including the wildly recognized Bringing Nature Home, as well as The Living Landscape, Designing for Beauty and Biodiversity in the Home Garden with Rick Dark and Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. If anyone feels particularly sad about the state of affairs around us, uh, just remember you can do your part in your landscape. Uh, tonight, Dr. Talmy will share with us his new book, The Nature of Oaks, The Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees. Be prepared to be inspired to treasure these trees and to act to nurture and protect them. Um, before we get started, uh, I have a few housekeeping announcements. You will notice that your camera and microphone have been turned off. The presentation will be recorded for your review and to share with friends and family members. And I hope you do. Uh, Dr. Talmy is not only knowledgeable, but quite entertaining. Uh, we have a series of questions that were submitted prior to uh, this evening's event. Those questions will be answered through the duration of the presentation or at the end as time allows. Um, uh, Wild One staff will be monitoring the chat box. And I have always found that Wild Ones members are happy to share their knowledge. So if you ask a question, you might actually get an answer in the chat box. So be aware of that. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Doug Tallamy. Thank you very much, Sally. It's a pleasure to be here. And we have a large audience, 988 so far. That is by far the biggest audience that has ever listened to this talk. So, so thank you. Um, I want to talk to you about the, the nature, the living things that are associated with oaks. And I'm going to start the discussion with the oaks at my house in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is uh, what it looked like when we moved in in July 2000. It had been a farm that was chopped up uh, and sold off. Uh, and we got one of those pieces. It had been mowed for hay before we, we moved in. It was a very old farm, so uh, very few plants there, and the ones that were there were, were quite beleaguered. So our goal was to do the best we could to restore the life to this, this piece of property. Uh, and and uh, so we moved in in July, and about a mile, mile and a half down the road, there are two big white oaks that were dropping acorns that fall. So we got some of those acorns, and I planted one right in the front yard, uh, and white oak acorns, of course, germinate in the fall. They put out their, their little radical and send it, send it down. But that's all they do in the fall. And then in the spring, they put up their first set of leaves and then pretty much sit there. And that's one of the reasons that it gives oaks the, the uh, it gives people the impression that oaks grow very slowly. Because in the beginning, it seems like they're growing slowly. But actually, that very first year, uh, they're not growing slowly. They're just growing underground. You can't see it. Uh, oaks grow 10 times more root biomass the first year than leaf biomass. So uh, here's, our, here's our little oak here. Um, this looks like it's maybe in year two. It's got a deer cage around it because it's got a lot of deer. Uh, but we're going to follow what happens on this oak. And this is what it looked like 18 years later. It's 45 feet tall. 
47 inch circumference canopy spread of 30 feet, still a baby of course, but in terms of landscape trees, it's a real tree. Uh, and it didn't take all that, that long. So one of the themes of tonight is that uh, oaks really are a lifeline to an awful lot of species. Dozens of bird species depend on uh, the food that oaks produce, both in the terms of, of insects and uh, acorns. Many, many uh, mammals, rodents, bears live in the, the uh, uh, cavities of the very large oaks, uh, raccoons, possums, all of those guys, a few uh, reptiles, several butterflies are specialists on oaks, but hundreds of species of moths depend on oaks, including the, their predators and their parasitoids. We've got a whole suite of cynipid gall wasps that make their galls on oaks. Many beetles are associated with oaks. Lots of spiders that I don't talk about because people don't like spiders. Uh, and then there's a whole community of arthropods and mollusks and annelids that, that depend on oak leaf litter underneath that tree. This diverse web of life though is typically uh, unnoticed and therefore unappreciated by the people who have oaks in, in their yards. And that is exactly why I wrote this book. Uh, it is a month by month guide to the life that is on your oaks. And my, my, uh, my hope was that the knowledge generated by this book would generate interest in uh, the oaks. And of course, interest generates compassion and we need a lot more compassion today towards the natural world. So first, a few facts. The genus Quercus, that's what the oaks are in, contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. So it's a large genus in, in terms of deciduous trees. Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. So oaks are fine trees, and they are indeed. There are four main taxonomic sections in the genus that are common in North America. There's the white oak group, Quercus, the red oak group, Labadi, the live oak group, Verentes, and a smaller uh, group in the west, the canyon oak group, Protobalanus. This is the distribution of oaks. The only places that do not have species of oaks that occur naturally are the brown areas. Every, every place else has at least one species of oak. Uh, so California has a number of species, but the center of distribution of oak diversity is in the southeast in uh, North America where most of the species, so up to 15 or 20 species right, right there in Tennessee. Oaks uh, live a long time. Uh, the average lifetime uh, for a healthy oak, believe it or not, is 900 years. They have 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods, uh, oaks are delivering unique ecological contributions to their landscape. Everybody wants to know what the oldest oak is. Uh, the oldest standing tree that we consider, you know, a typical tree would be the Middleton oak, a southern live oak that's about 1,500 years old. But there's a Palmer's oak in California. I believe Crestmore Heights, California, that uh, is actually clonal. It keeps cloning itself. Uh, and the estimates are that it's 13,000 years old. So oaks hang around a long time. This was the Y oak, the largest white oak in North America in Y, Maryland. Uh, it fell over, uh, well, I don't know, about 20 years ago, I guess now, uh, in a hurricane. I did get to see it before it fell over. But of course, it was it was huge. Uh, and and this is one of the things I want to talk about tonight is that many oaks are huge, but not all of them, which means there are options for uh, using oaks in even very small landscapes. So for example, that Palmer's oak, it's practically a, a, a ground cover. Uh, you wouldn't recognize it as a big tree at all. I also want to talk about their superior ecological function. Oaks have the highest biodiversity value, and I'll talk about what that means. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide. Very important today, of course, pulling the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, locking it up in their tissues. And because they're slow growing and dense, the very the tissues are very dense, they can hold more carbon than other trees. And they hold it longer. So, and then they've got giant root systems that pump that carbon into the ground for really long-term storage. Uh, because of those giant root systems, they're the best soil stabilizers. They make the best leaf litter, meaning the leaf litter they make lasts the longest a single oak leaf can uh, last up to three years before it breaks down. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. So I start the book in October and people say, why'd you start in October? Uh, because that's when I decided to start. My wife said, why don't you write a book about oaks? And it happened to be October and I said, okay. And I looked out the window and there was the oak that, that we're going to follow. 
Uh, and that's what it looks like in October. And October, of course, uh, is the month that uh, acorns uh, are, they start falling in September, but they certainly fall in, in October. It's a really important contribution of oaks to the local ecosystem. Because acorns are nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, and a single oak can produce up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. So that's contributing an awful lot of food to uh, local food web. And because of that, there are lots of creatures that depend on acorns. Certainly a lot of rodents, uh, but mammals of all kinds. The, your, your friend, the black bear, uh, loves acorns. And certainly our squirrel and even our, our cute little deer eat a lot of acorns. But then a lot of birds depend on them as well. Things like uh, turkeys, they're scouring the woods right now, picking up every acorn they can. Um, and many other birds, red belly woodpeckers, titmice, towhees, who knew? Uh, nuthatches, flickers, many ducks, uh, particularly wood ducks. Somebody sent me a, a video the other day of, I think it was 150 wood ducks in their yard eating acorns from the, the uh, oak trees that they had. Um, if the acorns fall in the water, the ducks die for them. So it's an important source of food for many creatures in the fall. There are a lot of invertebrates that depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil. That's the larva exiting the acorn after it's completed its development. That's what the adult looks like. Then there's uh, specialist moths called acorn moths. It's actually several species. They're indistinguishable as adults uh, because they all look alike, but it's a species complex that develops inside acorns. So with so many things eating acorns, uh, just not very long after those acorns drop. If you look under a, an oak tree, this is what it looks like. It's, it's, it's destruction. I mean, the, the healthy acorns are, are gone, eaten, um, or torn apart underneath the tree. And you might wonder how an oak ever successfully reproduces with all those things eating those, those seeds. And this is where jays come in. There's a very ancient mutualism between jays of uh, all species all over the world that um, depend on acorns for food. Uh, and oaks depend on jays for dispersal. That is the mutualism. Both lineages uh, evolved in Southeast Asia about 65 million years ago. So they're, they're old and they've been together for a long time. Jays, of course, are getting food in the form of those acorns, uh, which they use for winter food. But because they move those, those acorns a long way and because they forget where they put them, they allow oaks to move, to disperse faster than any other tree genus in the world. So jays are storing acorns for winter food. This is how it works. Um, they don't cache them. Uh, in other words, they don't pile a bunch of acorns in one place. They bury them singly. They can carry more than one acorn at a time, but they will bury them singly. Uh, and what they do is they pick up an acorn, then they'll fly up to a mile before they actually bury that. And that is farther from the parent tree than any other acorn disperser were, will move. Then they tap that acorn uh, beneath the soil surface. Now, if they think another jay has watched them do that, uh, they know about jays. They know that jays are stealers, so they will wait a few minutes, then, then dig up their acorn and move it because they know the other jay will come and take it from them. And the idea is that during the winter time, they will go back and retrieve those acorns that they have buried just beneath the surface of the soil. A single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. Uh, that typically would happen during a mast year when there's a lot of acorns, but they only remember where one out of every four acorns is when they're retrieving them, which means a single jay can plant 3,360 oak trees each year. That's a single jay. And of course, if a, if a sharp shin hawk comes and eats the jay, then it's not retrieving any of the acorns and it's planting even more uh, oaks. So that's, that's a very healthy relationship, both for the jays and the oaks. And it's not just blue jays, of course. Here's a scrub jay from Oregon doing the same thing. I think we have seven or eight species of jays in this country uh, and they're, they're certainly doing the same thing. Okay, November. Uh, November, you, you might realize, well, the acorns uh, are through dropping, and this was either a good year for acorns or it was a bad year for acorns, uh, because that's what oaks do. They either produce a lot of acorns or, or very few, and when they produce a lot, it's called a mast year, uh, and typically the members of a single group, like the white oak group or the red oak group, will all produce their acorns together in a particular region, which is curious behavior for trees so uh, ecologists always try to explain what's happening uh, out there in the world. Uh, so they come up with hypotheses. 
to explain oak masting. And there are four main hypotheses, uh, predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. And we'll look at each one of those. Keep in mind, all of these hypotheses can be happening at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. So predator satiation, here's an acorn weevil uh, outside of its, its acorn. They can get really numerous. Uh, when they build up in numbers, they can uh, be inhabiting 90% of the acorns that, that an oak tree makes. Uh, so if acorns and, and acorn weevils and acorn moths uh, and squirrels and all the things that eat acorns would stabilize their population around the number of, of acorns being produced if oaks made a very constant number of, of acorns. And then they'd end up destroying almost all the acorns uh, in any given year. But if oaks are highly variable in, in uh, the number of acorns that they make, so if they make a whole bunch one year, that actually uh, cre uh, causes the population of these acorn predators to explode. So you get a lot of acorn weevils, you get a lot of squirrels, a lot of chipmunks, all of these things are very happy. But then the next year, there's very few acorns and the populations crash. So that's called predator reduction. And it's usually two or three years of very low acorn production. So the, the populations of those things that depend on acorns gets depressed, it's quite small. And then there's another mass year where you have many more acorns than the size of the acorn eaters, the size of their population can handle. So that's where the predator satiation comes in. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated. Uh, and of course, wind pollination is, is a game of chance. Uh, the the uh, pollen has to move from the tree that is making the, the catkins, the male parts of, of the uh, oak catkins and the male flowers. They're producing the, the pollen. Uh, and even though female flowers are also produced on the same tree, they're produced later than the, the catkins release their pollen. So the pollen has to move to another tree, which is synchronized with in terms of when the uh, female flowers are produced. Uh, so it really is a game of chance. It depends on the wind, rain, and everything else. And if everything is making a whole lot of pollen at the same time, there's a better chance that your female flowers are actually going to receive pollen from the right tree at the right time. And then finally, energy allocation. Never enough energy to go around, so oaks tend to, to distribute it either towards growth, and if they grow a lot one year, then they produce very few acorns, or towards acorn productions. Acorns are, are big seeds. They take a lot of energy. And then they, they don't, uh, the trees don't grow very much those years. By the way, this is the scarlet oak in my front yard. So if you're wondering whether oaks have good fall color, uh, many of the species actually do. But energy allocation, uh, they, they rarely is there enough energy to, to grow a lot and make acorns at the same time. So they do one or the other. All right, it's now December. And this is the time of year that you may notice another peculiar feature of oaks. Remember, it's a deciduous tree. The leaves die in the fall, but uh, in many oaks, particularly the white oak group, uh, the leaves don't fall. And this is particularly true in younger trees and it's particularly true in the lower branches of younger trees. They hang on uh, the branches and they hang on all, all winter long. This is a condition called marcescence. Uh, so here you go, right in the middle of winter, you've got the leaves all clinging to the, to the oak tree. Uh, another curious behavior, why are they doing that? Well, the primary hypothesis has to do with the large Pleistocene mammals that used to occur in North America. This is a photo or a, a drawing of the large mammals that occurred just in Mexico. So you had the giant sloth that was, could reach up 18 feet. You had three species of, of uh, mammoths. Uh, you had lots of things that we call browsers. Browsers, that's what white-tailed deer do. Uh, they're not eating grass on the ground. They're browsing uh, woody material, particularly the, the buds of next year's growth. So if the oak trees retain their dead leaves from the previous year surrounding those, those precious buds for the future growth, uh, it's hard to get at those buds without a mouthful of, of dead leaves. So it makes it a less attractive resource. And the distribution of marcescent leaves supports that hypothesis because they only go up about 18 feet and that was the maximum reach of those, those giant slaws. The top of the tree or anything higher in the big trees uh, don't have marcescent leaves at all. Hard to prove, uh, but it's, it's a reasonable hypothesis. 
It also, Marcescens also gives oaks a landscape attribute that most other deciduous trees don't have. If you retain your leaves in the winter time, particularly the fall and, and most of the winter itself, uh, it, it creates a screen. So you can use your deciduous oaks to actually screen out your neighbor if that's important to you. Screens are, are uh, valuable plants in, in landscapes. And typically people use evergreens, but oaks will serve that purpose as well. Okay, January, it's cold, not much happening outside, not many people outside looking at what's happening outside. Uh, and if you stare up into the branches, the bare branches of your oak or many other trees either, you don't see anything, or at least that's the impression uh, that, that we have. Of course, you know, I'm an entomologist and all entomologists know that the insects are not up there eating leaves in the wintertime. There aren't any leaves to eat, so there's no insects up there. Then what are these little birds doing up there? Things like the golden crown kinglet or chickadees or titmice. Now, chickadees and titmice are at our feeders. 50% of their diet is seeds in the wintertime, but the other 50% is insects and spiders. But the golden crown kinglet uh, doesn't eat seeds at all. It's entirely insectivorous, yet it doesn't migrate. It stays here all winter, which is a very unusual behavior for uh, a, a bird that depends on insects. When the insects aren't there, what are they eating all winter long? Well, Bern Heinrich, uh, one of our, our outstanding uh, remaining naturalists, uh, he's, I think he's 82 this year. He's always asking questions, always thinking outside the, the box. Uh, and he, he lives in Maine. And he said, yeah, what the heck are kinglets eating in Maine? So he looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets and found they were filled with caterpillars in Maine in January. Caterpillars, where are they getting the caterpillars? Well, if you look at oak branches very carefully, you see there are caterpillars there. They just kind of sit there. They look like sticks. Many of them really look like sticks. Um, I climbed one of my, my oaks to, uh, in November, a couple, couple of years ago to get some vines that, off of it. Uh, and when I came back down, there were caterpillars all over my shirt. There were no leaves on the, on the tree, but uh, there are caterpillars up there. And that is what the birds are eating all winter long. When it gets cold, there are antifreeze proteins uh, that keep those, the cells of those caterpillars from bursting. Uh, and the caterpillars shrink a little bit. And when it gets warmer, they swell a little bit, but they just sit there. There's the caterpillar right there, by the way. Um, so again, curious behavior. Well, now we know what the, what the uh, birds are eating in the trees, but we don't know why these caterpillars are there. I mean, most insects over winter is eggs or as, as pupae or chrysalids, uh, or, or some even over winter as adults, or they migrate but most do not overwinter as, as larvae. And most of the caterpillars that are doing that, by the way, are in the family geometrity, they're the, the inchworms. Uh, well, you know, we don't know why they're doing it, but the leading hypothesis is that, of course, in the spring, the leaves burst forward, burst forth, and any caterpillar that is there in the third or fourth instar, you know, mostly uh, grown, can start eating them immediately. They have a head start over anything that was an egg or, or an adult that has to find a mate or, or a pupa that has to emerge as an adult and find a mate and then lay eggs. So they have first dibs on, on those fresh leaves uh, and it gives them a boost and they complete their development and, and uh, turn into an adult. February, February is truly the quietest time of oaks for oaks uh, in the, uh, the cold parts of the country. So it's a good time to look at what I call oak landscaping myths. Now, you know, a myth is typically based on, on some uh, amount of, of truth, of fact. Uh, and so I hear this all the time about oaks. We can't use oaks in our landscapes because they are too expensive. True or false? They grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. They're too big to use in a small lot. If we do use them, they'll fall over and crush our house or our car. Um, or they're going to lift up the hardscape, the, the roots will lift up the sidewalk and your, your driveway. So these are all, all reasons I hear why we can't use, use oaks. True or false? Let's look at each one of them. Are oaks too expensive? They can be, but only if you insist on instant gratification, if you insist on planting a large oak. Uh, so by large oak, I'm talking about, you know, 10, 15 feet tall. People do want, they want their, their landscape to go from nothing to finished. Uh, overnight, so they buy the largest tree that they can. But that is a mistake. That's a landscaping mistake. The, the nurserymen like it, of course, because they get to charge you 3,000 bucks to do that. But any oak that's grown in a pot, for example, 
is going to be root bound. There's no, no two ways about it. Remember those roots that are, that are developing right away? Well, they go around and around and around. And if you put that tree in the ground, they continue to grow, but then they strangle each other. And in, in three or four years, the oak will, will die. Uh, this is a... <laughs> This is the planting of oaks, and these are these are tall trees, easily 15 feet tall. So we got one, two, three, and a whole bunch in the back here. They were planted a couple summers ago in a park in Newark, Delaware. Every single one died, uh, and that is typically what happens when you try when you're planting a big tree, either because it's root bound or the other option is uh, to get a bald and burlap tree. Uh, and there, you know, we don't have a problem from root, root binding, but we have a problem from no roots at all because you have to chop the roots off in order to, to uh, ball and burlap a tree like that. It's actually a better option than, than the, the pot grown oaks, but it's still, it's, you know, it's a problem. There's 50% chance that it will die. Uh, and people who are looking for that instant gratification don't get it. You get a lousy looking tree like this that then sits, sits there for 10 years trying to build, rebuild the root mass that you've just chopped off. If you plant an acorn the same day you put this guy, this $3,000 tree in the ground, um, this acorn will sprout, grow slowly in the beginning, but by the end of that 10 years, when it's still looking just like this, uh, you will have a tree that is bigger and healthier uh, and live far longer um, than this tree you spent a lot of money in. And of course the acorn was, was free. So that's a, a great way, great size that you should uh, plant your oak at. Of course, nurserymen don't like that because they can't charge you a lot of money for that. But um, the smaller, the better. You will have a much healthier tree and it won't take that long to achieve that tree. How long does it take? Do oaks grow too slowly? Well, let's have a race here be between my friend, Bella. Everybody thinks she's my daughter. She's not my daughter. She's the daughter of a friend of mine. We, she spent a lot of time at our house. She was actually born on my wife's birthday. Here's the tree that we've been following. It's six years old here. Um, so yes, it started to, to, to break out of its slow growth period. Bella's two years old. So we're gonna have a grace. I know that the tree has a head start, but Bella's, Bella's a fast grower too. Here it is at seven years old, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, Bella's losing, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and there's 20, 2020, Bella's got her mask on, so we know what year it is. I can't even get the oak in, in the, the picture anymore. And Bella's pretty tall. Bella's very tall. She's taller than me, and you know how tall that is. Uh, but she clearly lost the race to, to the oak. That's, this is a white oak. It's supposed to be a real slow grower. Not so. Once it gets going, these oaks grow pretty quickly, and the red oak group grows even faster. Uh, the important point I want to make, though, is that you don't need a fast growing tree to start to contribute to the, the uh, ecosystem in your yard. Oaks contribute immediately. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground, uh, completing its development because that oak is there. So uh, you don't have to wait 400 years for your oak to start to, to uh, support the food web in your yard. And that of course is a really important goal. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Are oaks too large to use in small yards? Well, I can drive almost anywhere and find really large oaks in small yards, but I get it. There's no landscape uh, architect or designer that would ever uh, suggest that you put a large tree in a small yard like this. All I'm saying is it, it happens. And, and it's, so far it's, it's been okay for this, this house. I think these two red oaks were planted when this house was built probably more than a hundred years ago. Uh, and since that in that hundred years, they have drop the temperature around that house uh, at least 10 degrees. Remember in the old days, there was no air conditioning. So you wanted shading uh, just to, to keep the temperature down. They've also protected the house from uh, strong winter winds. They have not fallen over and, and crushed the house. And look, they haven't lifted up the hardscape either. Here's a, uh, can't remember what kind of an oak that was. It's a very large oak next to a very large church. Uh, so I'm not sure who came in, who, who you know, who was first, the tree or the church, but uh, they left the, the tree and, you know, it has no place to grow, but it's still doing really nicely. Um, so it can grow in a, in a small place, but again, no, no, no designer would ever recommend that. Point I want to make is there are a number of small oaks that can be used in landscaping. In the east, we've got dwarf chestnut oak that's typically in the, uh, in the trade, Georgia oak, which is occasionally in the, in the trade, 
Um, these are small oaks. The dwarf chestnut oak makes acorns when it's about five feet tall. Uh, we've got to keep the Georgia oak in the trade. It's, it's, um, it's probably a threatened species at this point, very small distribution, but we can, it's easily uh, uh, propagated by, by acorns and we can get it out there in the trade. And then a number of other small ones. You know, the, the big live oaks in the South, there's a dwarf live oak. It's, it's uh, you know, a, a subspecies of Quercus virginiana. In the West, we've got uh, many more options. And some of these, uh, uh, of course, are actually ground covers. Where's that? Gee, I don't, I don't even have Palmer's oak here. So that's another one. Um, look, dwarf oak, there's a lot of options there. We need to get these things in the trade so that people who have small yards feel comfortable using them so that we use them more often uh, as, as uh, street trees uh, because we don't have to worry about them going up and messing up the, the, the wires. We do have, have options. There's my uh, dwarf chestnut oak in my yard looking down on it and there are the, there are the acorns. Quercus prinoides. Another option for making small trees, which uh, nobody's doing, but we could be doing, and that is to actually coppice your oaks. So this is a red oak that uh, somebody chopped off when it was about four inches in, in diameter, uh, sawed it off at the ground, but you know didn't, didn't put any herbicide on it, and it comes back as a bush. I mean, that's what coppicing is. Uh, it was a standard uh, practice in, in forestry and in, in the colonial times. Um, they got firewood out of coppice, they made baskets, they did all kinds of things out of coppice, and they coppice lots of trees, but it allows you to have an oak bush instead of an oak tree, uh, having a lot of very valuable foliage in, in your yard, and it won't take up very much space. It, it's something that we ought to, we ought to try uh, more than we do. Will oaks crush your house? Uh, they could. They could. And of course, if they do anywhere in the country, you're going to hear about it on the news because we only talk about terrible things on, on the news. Uh, but the reason these big trees, oaks or not, are falling over is because of the way we plant them. We plant all trees as specimen trees, which means they are isolated from other such trees, which means typically their roots are not close enough together that they can interlock with each other. And then you get a lot of rain and strong wind and boom, over they go. That's not the way trees grow in a forest. They grow close enough that they form a matrix of interlocking roots. Uh, so that it's very difficult to, to blow them over. And before somebody says, I saw a tree fall over in the forest, I know, I've seen that too. But um, look at the way that the, the roots, often those root system has been damaged or it's in a very wet area and it's not interlocked with, with other trees. This is a, a stream cut, which shows how tree roots interlock with each other. They don't have to be the same species. That is an oak, I believe, by the way. But that's one, two, three, four trees, totally interlocked. Uh, you get that strong straight line wind, it will not blow these guys over. Uh, if you get a tornado, it'll snap them off, and there's nothing we can do to, to landscape in a way that tornadoes, that are tornado proof, but um, they won't be blowing over when you, when you group them like that. So rather than the specimen tree, let's think about making groves of trees. Here are two white oaks down the street from me. Actually, these are the ones we got the acorn from. Uh, when we started our little restoration. That's three feet between those, those two trees. Now here's a road, they put it in after these trees were, were here. Um, and neither one is gonna be as big or splendid as it would be alone, but they're much more stable than if they were, were isolated. Here are three, uh, it's called the Three Sisters in Northwest Connecticut, three oaks that um, obviously have very, very uh, locked in roots. This is a tree grove in uh, one of the DuPont estates in, in Hocus and Delaware, Mount Cuba Center. There's a big red oak back here, but we've got hemlocks, we've got rhododendrons down here. Uh, this is the planned landscape. They planted this back in the 30s, a hardscape down here. It's very fancy, but it's an attractive tree grove that gives us the idea we can actually create these little forest patches in our yards in a way that would make them very stable. Now, I know there's, there's, uh, there are some diseases like oak wilt that will uh, transfer from one tree to another through root grafts. So uh, it might be better practice to not put the same species next to each other, but to vary it with other species. But you can stabilize your trees by planting tree groves instead of having just specimen trees. Will your oaks lift up your sidewalks or your, your driveways? Um, they can, depending on uh, what they're planted over and the species of tree. So many oaks have very deep, deep roots. This is a pin oak, believe it or not. And, and uh, look, it's not 
not lifting up this street at all. Here are two big red oaks at the University of Delaware. I mean, look at the size of that tree right next to the, to the curb. It is not a given that it's gonna lift up your, uh, your hardscape. If you plant over bedrock, the roots have no place to go except laterally. So yes, that would be something to watch out for. If you plant over an agricultural pan, you know, the pan, it's, it's um, compacted soil created by plowing for 100 years and at the same depth, you go down uh, 12, 18 inches and it's, and it's rock hard. So the roots grow along the pan and rather than going down deeper. Break up the pan if you know you're over an old ag field uh, and then your roots will penetrate. But again, not a given that your oak is going to ruin your hardscape. All right, those are, those are myths, uh, some truth to them, but um, some myth to them as well. Okay, March. March is when those marcescent leaves uh, actually start to, to drop. Uh, so it's a good time to talk about leaf litter. What are the leaves doing once they hit the ground? Uh, but first, there's a lot of variation in, in uh, oak leaf shape, both within a tree. So juvenile leaves are much bigger than adult leaves, but the type of, of uh, the leaf shape varies dramatically depending on uh, what species it is. Here's an emery oak uh, from Arizona that looks just like a holly. Here's a willow oak that looks like willow. Uh, and, and, you know, around, around the country we go. A single mature tree can produce 700,000 leaves each year. And if you line them up next to each other, that covers four tennis courts. Uh, and of course, that's what leaf litter does. It falls to the ground and covers the ground. That's its function. That's one of its functions, is to provide a, a blanket that protects the soil organisms, the, the, the soil community, which is what allows our plants to grow, protects them from drying out, protects them from soil erosion, protects them from overheating of the soil, and keeps the moisture in, in the soil. All of the soil organisms require high humidity. The second job of, of leaf litter is to decay and return the nutrients to the soil so that your tree can take it up again. Uh, so, you, so leaf litter is very valuable. People who rake it up and burn it or put it out uh, by the, the curb as trash are throwing away a valuable resource that the plants on your, your property need. So we need to find ways to landscape that keeps all of the leaves on our landscape so the nutrients can, can uh, feed. That's what feeds the, the soil organisms. They're all detritivores, turning the, those uh, nutrients over, putting them back in the soil, and then our plants can take them up again. You never have to fertilize your trees if you keep your leaf litter on site. Um, remember, the, the soil community harbors more species than are found above ground. They're small, and, and by the way, a lot of people say, well, I can't keep the leaves on my flower beds because the plants won't be able to get through. Well, you know, what did the plants do before we came here and raked all the leaves uh, away? They obviously got through. Now, you can't put five feet of leaves uh, in a flower bed and expect the plants to get through. But here's a, a fern bed that uh, nobody planted. It's all natural, natural uh, layer of, of oak leaves there that they are through. It's a very healthy little micro ecosystem. In one square meter of soil under an oak tree, you can have 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails, columbulins, this is smithurid, a smithurid columbulin, 90,000 proturins, uh, those are tiny primitive insects, uh, little teeny white guys, you, you practically need a microscope to see them, a million nematodes, there are a lot of living things in that one square meter. And again, what they're doing is breaking down the leaf litter and returning the nutrients to the soil. Uh, there are uh, some very attractive butterflies that depend on oak leaf litter, like the banded hair streak develops on, on oak leaf litter. It eats this stuff on the ground. I've never found a caterpillar. They're there because uh, the, the, the adults are not, not very uncommon, but they blend right in, very tough to find. Uh, but there are a number of species of moths that depend on leaf litter uh, in general, and particularly oak leaf litter. Uh, 70 species of moths we call litter moths. This is the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus and 67 others. And they're breaking down the, the leaves as well as caterpillars. And then you've got all the predators that are eating those, those caterpillars and all the other life forms that are. So it's a thriving community when you leave the leaf litter under your tree. April, April is when uh, the buds start to break. So you've had buds all winter long. The marcescent leaves have protected them from those large Pleistocene mammals that aren't here anymore. 
Uh, and now the, the buds are, are breaking. And it's the chance for you to see one of the most ephemeral interactions that occurs in all of nature. It takes about five minutes each year. And it's when the Sinipid gall wasps, the little wasps that make the galls on trees, actually lay their eggs in the buds of, of oaks. So here's a female sinipid. There's her ovipositor right there. She's injecting an egg into this bud. This is a male sinipid who is riding the female. He's already mated with her, but after she lays this egg, she will mate again. And he wants to be the guy she mates with. And here's a hopeful male that would love to push him off. And maybe he'll try later on. Um, and that's why this guy's sitting here. He's got to he's got to protect his his paternity, make sure that she uses his sperm and not his sperm. What she's doing is she's not only injecting an egg, but she's injecting plant hormones that control the growth of these undifferentiated cells, these meristematic cells that are in the buds. Think of the cells in a tree bud as stem cells. They can be uh, shaped into lots of different uh, types of structures, and that's exactly what these plant hormones do. People talk about galls as if they are cancerous growths. I don't like that analogy because cancer is uncontrolled growth. It just goes crazy. Galls are extremely controlled growth. Each species of sinipid has a species specific gall shape, actually two gall shapes because they have two generations a summer and each uh, generation has a very different shape gall. Uh, and that shape is a compromise between the manipulation of the Sinipid and the uh, manipulation of the oak itself. So here's a uh, female uh, gall wasp. They're, they're quite small, laying an egg in this this uh, oak bud, and I put a little string around it so I could see what would come out of it. That's the gall that resulted from that that particular egg. There are over five thousand species of sinipid gallers in the world uh, that uh, are are on oaks. A single oak tree can support 70 different species of, of gaulers. So it's, a, it's an important component of oaks and it's hard to find an oak that does not have a gall associated with it. Many of the galls are hollow. This is the apple oak gall. And if you cut it open, it's a very curious structure. There's a hard central core and it's within that core, that disc in the middle here that um, the larva of the sinipid is actually growing. But all of this is, is air, it's open. And then you got the outside of the gall. Why do you have all this space here? Well, it turns out that sinipid gallers have more species of parasitoids, of, of uh, other wasps that lay their eggs in the sinipid gallers. We call them parasitoids instead of parasites because parasitoids kill their hosts and parasites don't. So these guys definitely kill their hosts. That is their weapon there. That's the female, that's her ovipositor. And what she does is uh, injects an egg into the galler if she can reach it from the outside of the gall. So if this gall grows very quickly and separates the, the parasitoid from the galler itself with this space there, um, then it's safe. So there is a period where it's vulnerable when the gall hasn't grown uh, enough, but uh, now it's safe from, from all of the parasitoids. They don't have an ovipositor big enough to reach the, the galler. Gall shape uh, is, uh, there's a lot of variation into it, in it. Uh, actually it's fantastic variation. Many of the, the uh, galls look like plant diseases. People mistake them for plant diseases. There are 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies. Most of those are uh, sinipids and most of those are on, on oaks. Some of the galls are on the leaves themselves, others are on the stems, um, and then they just have lots of, of really fancy shapes. Again, many of them look like uh, diseases. Uh, some look like pottery. Some look like brains. Uh, this is the uh, large uh, gall that's on Quercus gariana, uh, the, uh, the Oregon white oak, um, common in California, Oregon, and, and Washington. It's one of the largest galls we have. These holes here are exit holes where the uh, galler has, has already left the gall. And then, of course, the gall just stays there for quite a, quite a long period. Galls also have an interesting... Um, role in our recorded history, our meaning, meaning humans. Because if you grind up uh, this gall right here and combine it with uh, various chemicals, it makes an indelible black ink. And we discovered thousands of years ago that, that we could write with that ink and it would, would not disappear. So all of our important writing was done with gall ink. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. 
the, the monks and scribes of the Middle Ages all worked with, with gall ink. So our recorded history is recorded because we figured out how to make ink out of, out of galls. That hole there again is where the gauler left the gall. After the marcescent leaves drop in April, uh, that's a good time to look for polyphemus moth cocoons. Uh, because they, they hang from a branch of the, of the oak, and it's a large silvery-shaped cocoon. It's one of the giant silk moths. That's what the caterpillar looks like, a big sausage-shaped uh, caterpillar. Um, cardinals love to, to feed their, their young uh, polyphemus moth caterpillars because it's a big meal. And that's what the adult looks like. So if you find one on your oak, it's, that's a good thing, because these things are becoming uh, less numerous every single year. Uh, because of, of what we do. Largely, we take away their host plants and we turn on lights at night. Uh, and both those things are devastating this giant silk moth populations. You can fix that, put the host plants back and turn your lights off at night. Okay, May is when the life really gets going on our, on our oaks because the leaves fully expand uh, and, and take on their shape that they're gonna have the rest of the summer. So following the expansion of, of leaves after the buds break, we have the appearance of the caterpillars that eat those leaves. Caterpillars, by the way, are transferring more energy from oaks and, and all the other plants to animals than any other type of plant eater. So caterpillars are an essential component of the food web. And if we look at the diversity and numbers of caterpillars on any plant, we know how much that plant is contributing to the local food web. And following the appearance of all these, the appearance of all these caterpillars, of course, is the appearance of the things that eat those caterpillars, which is the migrating birds. It is no co coincidence that our migrants arrive just as the caterpillar populations on these, these um, expanding oak leaves are, are peaking. And it's also no coincidence that migrants, particularly the warblers, are spending most of the time in oak trees. Any, any birder worth his or her salt knows that if she's going to look for warblers, she's got to go to um, oaks. Why? Because that's where the food is. How many times would you go to, to Acme or ShopRite uh, shopping if all the shelves were bare? You'd go once and figure out this is not the place to find the food and you'd never go back. It's exactly what the birds do. I had a, a student uh, several years ago now, Christy Beal, who looked at the amount of time warblers, the amount of minutes warblers spent foraging in large ornamental trees in cemeteries uh, and these are all the families of trees that, that were out there. And these are the bars that show how long, how much time the warbler spent in each tree. This first uh, bar here is the phagaceae. That's where the oaks are. The next is pines and birches. Uh, well, in her study site, oaks, phagaceae contain the oaks and the American chestnut and um, beaches. But in her study site, her study sites, there were no beaches and there were no chestnuts. So it was entirely oaks. So you're looking at the contribution of oaks to warbler foraging and obviously it, it dominates it. Why are they there? Because again, that's where the food is. Uh, things like the purple crested slug caterpillar, the, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checker fringe prominent, the laugher. The lace cap caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, oblique heterocampa, variable oak leaf caterpillar, banded tussock moth, hickory tussock moth, red line panopoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug. They're called slug caterpillars because the head is tucked up underneath, not because they're, they're slugs. The streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the hesitant dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the uh, spiny oak slug, and my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar, which I just think is the coolest caterpillar in all of North America. And hundreds more species are on oaks. Uh, this is what our, our yard looks like now. The oak that we're following is over here. You can't see it from this perspective, but this is where I was standing when I took that first picture. Um, we do have a little lawn here. We're very traditional, but I put a lot of plants back. And because we put the plants back, we've got a lot of species of moths running the food web at our house. And four years ago, I decided to take a picture of every species of moth I could find on our property. I am still at it. Uh-oh, I'm behind. It's 1,139 species of moths in, in our yard, 30% of which are using oaks. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. 
What's a keystone speaking? Remember what a keystone is? Uh, this is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. If you take the stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses. And that's because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. Uh, and this is, this is uh, a, a feature that is consistent all over, all over the country. No matter what county you're in, no matter what state you're in, whether it's dry, whether it's north or south, uh, whether it's east or west, it's a very consistent pattern. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. Those are the keystone plants. So think of them as the two by fours in the ecological house that you're building. Your house won't stand up without those, those two by fours, those keystone plants. You can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper, which is what we've been doing with our, our decorative plants over the years. Uh, you're not through building your house uh, once, once you have your keystone plants, but they're essential component of that local food web. Why am I talking about this? Because oaks are the best keystone plants in 84% of the counties in which they occur. In the, in the uh, mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950, actually right now it's 952 species that we know of nationwide. And there's no other plant genus that comes close to that. Uh, so in most places where oaks occur, oaks are the number one keystone plant. Which oaks are best? Everybody asks me this. Um, remember, we got 91 species. Nobody's compared all of them. Very tough to do that. But I did have a student look at 16 species uh, this, this summer. Uh, and he, he measured the, the uh, degree to which caterpillars are contributing, or which oaks are contributing to the food web by the amount of leaf area eaten out of various species. He had enough replicates uh, um, to be able to graph uh, what you see here. It's not 16, but it's, it's close to it. Um, and the, the point here is that there's not a whole lot of difference among the oaks. All the oaks are, are good. This is Quercus alba, the white oak up here, a little bit, little bit better than the others. All of these are not significantly different. Um, the only time you drop down is when you get oaks that are out of their native range. So this is the water oak. We're just north of the, the uh, northernmost water oak population. This is uh, willow oak right here. Again, we're, we're just north of, of where they're naturally found. This is, um, which means they are farther north than the things that are associated with them. So that's why they have less, less damage. This is Quercus acutissima. It's from China, sawtooth oak. You might say, well, why are things eating that? And that's what I asked my, my undergraduate. What was on Quercus acutissima? And he said, it was Japanese beetle which of course is from China too. So, um, you know, I wish he had not included them, but anyway, uh, so they're not supporting uh, our, our native caterpillars the way the other oaks are. But um, I would not choose my oaks based on, on which is gonna make the most food because they're all good. I would, and just in comparison, you know, the, the uh, in the mid-Atlantic states that support 557 species, tulip trees support 21. Crepe myrtles support zero, ginkgos support zero. So there are huge differences here. So oaks are good. I would pick oaks based on uh, the soil type and the altitude, the oak that belongs there. That's the one you wanna go for. Or I would also slant it towards the oaks that uh, are more resistant to the diseases you have in your neighborhood. Uh, so we're getting clobbered right now by bacterial leaf scorch uh, and that hits the red oak group more than the white oak group where we are. So I favor the white oak group. You move a little farther west, the white oak group's getting clobbered by oak wilt. So I favor the red oak group. That's a, a, a more, a, a better, uh, excuse me, trait to consider when you're choosing your oaks. Why do we need all these caterpillars, by the way? Well, let's just talk about birds. Birds, birds rear their young on caterpillars. Um, I, you know, I've been saying this for a long time. We always use chickadees as an example, but they're just examples of, of what most of the birds are doing out there. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees, just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, uh, the parents continue to feed the babies another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that is a third of an ounce. And that depends on the number of chicks in, in the clutch. Uh, so oaks can do that. Your crepe myrtle can't do that. Your eucalyptus can't do that. They're not making caterpillars like this. That's why those keystone plants are essential. If you want any birds in your yard and all the other things that eat uh, the insects associated with, with these trees, you have to have the trees that, that make that food, that are willing to pass on some of their, their energy. 
Okay, June is the month uh, of, of cicadas, at least this year. This is when we had the uh, periodical cicada emergence uh, in, in uh, much of the East. Uh, we had the 17-year brood emerge at my house. There's also a 13-year brood, and it's scattered around the eastern part of the country. No periodical cicadas in, in the West, so um, you folks will just have to look at the pretty pictures here for a while. That's what a periodical cicada looks like. They're, they're etched in black and orange rather than green, uh, and they come out in uh, June rather than later on in the summer. Um, and the media, of course, they love to vilify nature. You know, this is going to be a terrible scourge and we all should all fear it. And they sing so loud, it's going to drive us crazy and we're going to kill our babies. It's going to be terrible. Well, it's not an invasion. It's one of the most fantastic biological events you'll ever have the privilege to witness. I heard uh, an old, my old lab, lab mate, uh, Mike Raup, being interviewed on, on NPR. And he said, he said, you know, this is, this is entomologist Super Bowl. We're all looking forward to this. And it was great. It was it was really good. Um, this is a tree at, at uh, right in front of my building at, at the University of Delaware. We had a good emergence this year. Uh, and when they come out, of course, they they leave holes in the ground that aerates the soil. It's very good for the trees for the for the roots. Uh, and they were numerous. They were so numerous that eleven Mississippi kites flew up from wherever they were and stayed in the Newark Delaware area for two weeks, eating our our cicadas. We don't get to see Mississippi kites very much, so that was impressive. Here's the life cycle. The nymph uh, emerges. They are feeding on xylem on roots for 17 years, uh, and they crawl out at night because it's safe to emerge at night. They hang from vegetation, split the back skin, and then hang down, swing up and grab on there, and then they hang until they, they tan their exoskeleton. Uh, so this is like a soft shell crab. Um, it's totally vulnerable right now, but it hangs there until it, it uh, gets all hard and it can actually fly away. It does fly away. Then the males will sing to attract females. This is a constant theme among singers. Singing is, is expensive, energetically expensive. So males always do the energetically expensive thing because females have to make those expensive eggs. Sperm are cheap, eggs are expensive. So, so males uh, balance that by, by singing. <clears throat> they have a little They've got plates on either sides of their thorax that click like a Coke can. If you click an empty Coke can, click, 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 click. They're clicking these plates with muscles, uh, and I don't know what it is, 300 times a second or something like that, and it causes a buzzing. And there's a, 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 a space behind each one of these plates, it's called the resonance chamber, that creates that loud buzz. And it goes over and over and over again but we didn't kill our babies. And they're calling in females. The females come, they mate, um, and then the female starts to, to lay her eggs. Here's their ovipositor, highly sclerotized. It's, like, it's just like a sword. This is a pin oak branch here, and she's jamming that straight into the, the branch. Here it is all the way in. Um, if you ever take a pin and try to push it into a, a pin oak branch, it's hard. Uh, but she does it, and what she does is lay her eggs, one, then another, and then another, right, right down in a row, and that's how they, they uh, oviposit. From the point where they lay their eggs on out, it typically kills the branch. It's called flagging, and again, people get upset, oh, they're going to kill my oak. Um, no, they're just going to prune it. This is nature's pruners, and it only happens once every 17 years, so uh, just, just go with it. It's okay. The eggs hatch, and then they drop down to the ground, burrow down, and then they start to feed on the, the tree roots. Uh, another friend of mine, Rick Carban, did his PhD on periodical cicadas, trying to measure well, the impact on the trees of all of these, these cicadas drinking xylem from the roots. Xylem is practically water. There's almost no nutrients in it at all. And you can have a lot of, of uh, nymphs developing on an oak tree without impacting the tree at all. He could find no measurable impact on the trees that had cicadas on them. And another student this summer look at where the uh, cicadas were, were laying their eggs, where there was the most flagging. And the green bars here are different species of oaks, red oak, white oak, willow oak. Here's pin oak back here. Um, and then other types of trees, but clearly they, they favored uh, laying their eggs in there in the oaks. And then they die and that's it. Uh, so the whole, whole thing takes, I don't know, three weeks, something like that. Uh, and then they're gone for 17 years. Why do they stay underground for 17 years? Because uh, it's predator satiation again. There are a lot of things that eat cicadas. 
Uh, but if all the cicadas come out at once synchronously, there are never enough squirrels or birds to be able to eat them all. So they get to, to most of them escape predation and do very well. July, this is when the night chorus begins. And if anybody's camped uh, wherever an oak forest is, you know what I'm talking about in the summertime. I'm talking about the songs that Katie did sing. Uh, we're talking about males again. There's a sclerotized plate on their forewings and they lift up their wings and rub it back and forth, a scraper in a file, and it makes a species specific song. And this is why they do it. This is a true story, by the way. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. Surely you've heard that sound. Um, that used to sing me to see if I did a lot of camping when I was young, and it was very soothing, soothing sound. But same thing, the males are trying to be as loud as possible because females will choose males based on loudness. Whoever is the, is the loudest will attract the most mates uh, because um, loud is associated with size, which is associated with good genes. She's trying to get the best genes for her, her offspring. This is what a female looks like. Uh, in her fifth instar, before she matures, the wings are not developed yet, but the ovipositor is. It's a big spatula-shaped thing. And here she is when, when the wings are developed. She takes that ovipositor and glues these big flat eggs to uh, the twigs of whatever she's laying eggs on. These guys have already hatched. Um, and you, you know, sometimes people see these and wonder what they are. Katie did spend most of their life up in the canopy. Um, they do love oaks. Uh, not, it's not the only thing they, they eat, but... Um, there are four species of katydids that are, that are common in oak forests, and they will sing in July and through August uh, and then into September. It depends on how cold it gets, how fast before they, they die out. Okay, August. August is a real challenge for the things that eat oaks because throughout the season, oak leaves have been getting tougher and tougher and tougher. It's a primary defense to keep all of those things from eating, eating oaks. And there's two ways to get around leaf toughness. Uh, the leaves are tough because they're full of tannins, they're full of lignans, but if you eat gregariously, if you all get together and, and, and put all your mouths together, you can get through that, that leaf toughness. And that's what a lot of the caterpillars that eat oaks in, the, in August do. They feed gregariously. This is the yellow neck caterpillar when it's young. There it is when it's older, but they're eating all at the same time. A common mechanism, this is the uh, yellow hump, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm. They're all gregarious. I found 115 yellow neck caterpillars on our oak tree right at the bottom here. No, no ladders, just walked around. Um, they were on the branches there. And you know, if I, if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 115 yellow neck caterpillars eating your tree, most people would get the spray can or call the man and save the tree. You've got to kill them all. No, you don't. This is a natural, it's a natural feature of, of oaks and other trees too. Uh, the caterpillars can eat these trees, which means there's food for other things in your yard. If you look at the leaves in your yard and there's no holes in them, that means you've got a dead food web. The, the, all the energy is locked up in the, in the leaves and it's not supporting anything. There's a, a woman in uh, New Orleans, Tammany Baumgarten, I met several years ago, and she suggests that we all practice the 10-step program. You take 10 steps back from your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. And I think this, that is great advice because, and this is the distance at which we view our trees. You can't see any of those yellow neck caterpillars. You can't see the branch they were defoliating and it doesn't hurt the tree at all. Another way to get through, uh, get by oak uh, leaf toughness, uh, which is concentrated in the epidermis, the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis is to only eat the stuff in the middle. The, the, the mesophyll, palisade mesophyll or the parenchymal cells, it's soft and nutritious. That's where all the nutrition is anyway. So you mine the leaves, you become a leaf miner. But to become a leaf miner, you gotta be really small and really thin. This is a serpentine leaf mine made by a little serpentine leaf miner caterpillar. The egg was laid here and it started to eat in between the upper and lower epidermis. The black line in the middle here is, is its poops. That's its brass as it goes. And then it pupated here. And you see these, these uh, scars, these feeding scars in leaves all the time. 
This is a blotched leaf miner. There's the caterpillar right there. It just goes in a circle and makes it bigger and bigger, mining the, the, uh, the oak leaf. Here's the caterpillar when it's black lit. Uh, and there it is with a real good picture by Salvador Vitanza. Uh, it doesn't look much like a caterpillar, but it actually is. And that's what the adults look like. This is one of the Camomaria species that, that uh, feed on oaks. Um, they look just like uh, moths, but they are, well, they are moths, but they're really tiny. They are really tiny. So this is the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner. A number of species have gotten around oak leaf toughness by being tiny. It's also a very dangerous time to, to feed on oaks because the predators of these caterpillars, the populations are peaking in August. This is uh, the uh, yellow, yellow striped oak worm. And here's a potter wasp, a eumenid potter wasp that has just stung it. So it's paralyzed and she's gonna carry it off and stuff it in her, her mud pot and then lay an egg on it. That egg is gonna hatch and eat this caterpillar alive, which sounds gruesome, but it's, it's Refrigeration, it's, it replaces refrigerators. The potter wasp does not have a refrigerator. Uh, and if, it's, if it killed the caterpillar and then laid an egg on it, the caterpillar would rot before the egg even hatched. If it paralyzes it, then it keeps it fresh just as if it had put it in, in the refrigerator. So it's a standard uh, mode for all of these, these uh, wasps that are, wasps by the way, eat a lot of caterpillars all the time. This is a, an egg mass of the yellow neck caterpillar. They laid them all together so they can feed gregariously. Minutes after the adult finished laying this egg, a tiny little wasp, an inserted wasp came uh, and is gonna lay its eggs in each one of these eggs or at least many of them. And that's, these are the, the uh, little parasitoids when they were emerging uh, from these eggs. She, boy, it looks like she had almost 50% of them. And that's, it's natural control. That's why we don't have too many things eating oak trees, because you got an awful lot of enemies eating those, those caterpillars, including tachinid flies. There are thousands of species of tachinid flies. Uh, they are parasitoids, uh, and they're laying eggs on caterpillars too. So here's a tachinid egg laid on a, a uh, um, Saddleback caterpillar, got a lot of senior moments these days. Saddleback caterpillar, the eggs are gonna hatch, it's gonna tunnel into the saddleback. This is a tachinid larva that it already has tunneled in and that's its breathing tube. It sticks it out through the side so it can breathe. And here's a little teramelid wasp, which is laying eggs in the saddleback. So this, this caterpillar is dead three times over. It's never gonna reach adulthood. It's almost impossible to collect a caterpillar at the end of the summer and rear it out uh, without it being parasitized. Here's a contracted uh, Daytana, another uh, oak feeder. It's got three tachinid eggs on its head with a fourth one here that's already hatched. This caterpillar is not gonna make it. This is a black blotch caesura. It's a caterpillar that has, has learned how to avoid tachinids by having three permanent markings on its rear end that look like tachinid eggs. So the fly comes and says, oh, you're already parasitized. I will leave you alone. Works really well for the black blotch caesura. Another uh, method is to roll off the leaf that you're feeding on and hang from a silken thread. You can't see the thread here, but it's there. Uh, and a lot of caterpillars do that. Some caterpillars do it all night long to avoid predators that just hang from their, their thread. And these are the types of predators they're avoiding. This is a bricotted wasp. But some of these species are really smart. They take their first pair of legs and they actually pull it up, pull up the string, uh, and then, then lay an egg in the caterpillar. Or they shinny down that silken string and lay an egg in the caterpillar. Dangerous time to be uh, a caterpillar. Okay, September, that's our last month. This is when cricket populations peak. And we all know about the black crickets on the ground, but there are uh, several species of tree and bush crickets, which are yellow or green. And you can find them up in your oak trees, doing the same things that the cicadas and the katydids do. The males are trying to attract the females. Uh, but these guys are smart. They find a hole in the leaf or they chew a hole in the leaf of the appropriate size. They stick their head through it and then raise their wings and rub them back and forth, making their, their species specific sound. But the leaf is typically cup shaped like a parabola and it projects that sound farther and louder than it would if this guy was on a flat surface. So he's sending a false message to the females. He says, I'm the loudest male around because I'm the biggest, strongest. He's not the biggest and strongest, but he might be the smartest. Uh, and that's good enough for her. So she will come and mate with him. Uh, it's also the month that you're most likely to see walking sticks. Walking sticks can be pretty common in oak forests. They're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. 
This is an emery oak in, in Arizona, uh, and this guy was down low. But usually you don't see these guys until um, later in the season, September or sometimes even October, they'll start to come down. They're typically not very common, although there are records of walking sticks defoliating parts of oak forests in, in West Virginia. So sometimes they have outbreaks, although I've never seen that. All right, we've gone through the year. We've talked about just some of the things that are associated with, with oaks. Most of the examples, of course, are from the east. I live in the east, but many of the same creatures or, or related species are occurring in the west. So now it's time to, to talk about what it all means. Um, now, you know, we have a biodiversity crisis, and you know why. We have created it. You hear all the time that the birds are disappearing, the, the insects are disappearing. Nothing's disappearing. We're killing them. We're killing, we're killing our birds. We've got 3 billion fewer birds now than we had 50 years ago. We've got global insect decline because we kill them all the time and take away what they need. And that's why Earth has experienced its sixth great extinction event. But this is the only one that's ever been caused by, by an organism. And that, of course, is, is us. So we have a biodiversity crisis. It is a global crisis. It's a crisis for humans because this is the biodiversity that runs the ecosystems that supports us. The good news is it has a grassroots solution, meaning we can turn this around. And by we, I mean everybody on the planet. It's not going to happen from top-down regulation. It's going to happen from, from action from all the members of, of planet Earth. There are four things that every landscape has to do today. They all have to capture carbon. They all have to manage the watershed. You know, everybody lives in a watershed. Nobody, nobody has the right to develop a landscape in that watershed that actually wrecks the watershed. And all the landscapes have to support a diverse community of pollinators, not because they pollinate our crops, because people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need pollinators. It's because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. So we need pollinators everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. And all landscapes have to support a complex food web to support the animals that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. It has to happen everywhere. When you plant an oak, you are addressing three of the four goals that have to happen uh, on, on every landscape. You're planting the tree that's going to capture the most carbon. It's going to manage the watershed the best. It's going to support the most complex food web. The only thing oaks don't do better than everything else is support a complex community of pollinators, and that's because they're wind pollinated. But three out of four is pretty good. So oaks have a lot of landscape attributes, but despite all those landscape attributes, oaks are in trouble. The old giants are gone. The forest used to be we filled with those, you know, hundreds of year old oaks with giant centers. By the way, you know, when the the, the tree man comes to your yard and he says your oak has a hollow, hollow spot in, in its trunk, and most big oaks do, that's normal. You know, pipes are hollow but pipes are also extremely strong. All the strength is in the outer edge. And that's true with, with the old giants as well. The living portions of the oak are, are um, on the outside of the tree and they can be hollow for hundreds of years without falling over. So don't fall for the, you gotta take it down because there's a hollow spot. Hollow spots are normal. Anyway, we cut them down, they're gone. Uh, the percentage of oaks in our Eastern forest has been cut in half in the last hundred years because we've, we've suppressed fire, which favors oaks. Um, We've introduced a number of diseases and, and pests like gypsy moth, and we've high graded our forests. In other words, when we, when we log, we take the best trees and leave the worst. Uh, and the best trees, of course, are, are, the, are the oaks. And we've done that for a long time. 28 of our 91 North American oak species are threatened. A third of the global oak species are endangered. The Oregon white oak has lost 97% of its range. Uh, not because of diseases or anything, but because you know, that's where the agriculture is. We just chop them all down. There are 2,300 species of plants and animals in Great Britain that rely on oaks that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. And you know they're rebuilding the, the roof of Notre Dame Cathedral with oaks from France. They're using 6,000 large oaks from France. It's probably every last one of them. So they can put the roof back on, on Notre Dame. We humans live our life out in a very brief ecological instant of time. And we cannot return the ancient oaks to our landscapes during that period, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today will be large enough to uh, at least partially assume their keystone positions in our yard. Um, the big guys are really important, but small guys are really important too, and they don't stay small very long. 
everybody on the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because everybody in the planet requires healthy ecosystems. There's no debate about that. The best way to exercise your responsibility to earth stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of turkeys, for the sake of chickadees, of woodpeckers, of uh, warblers and jays, of thrushes, of emeralds, of, of uh, prominence, of gallers, of weevils, of orthopterans, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Tallamy. Uh, I always find your presentations fascinating. Um, even though I might have seen parts of it before, it's, it's, there's so much to absorb. Um, I'm always learning something and I'm sure uh, everyone here has too. There's a lot of awesomes and wows and uh, other people appreciating it. Um, you didn't get to see this, Dr. Tallamy, but um, well, when staff are busy attempting to answering some of the questions that are coming in through the, the chat box and Q&As, and we will be posting, um, we'll, we'll get the chat out, a uh, link to it to the participants tonight. So you'll be able to refer back to some of that information. Um, okay. Yeah, and there were quite a few questions about oak wilt. And I know Dr. Tommy's not a plant pathologist, and I know well enough to know that it is a terrible thing. It, it is a foreign pathogen, it's a fun, fungus, and it is, uh, it is just the latest pest coming from somewhere else and disrupting the ecosystem. Central and, America. Uh, you, Comes from Central America. Yeah, thanks a lot, Central America. Yeah. Um, Every so often, and I, I, I do. I do. Want, I'm not a pathologist, but I do want to say something about the diseases. It's not just wilt. It's not just very bacterial leaf scourge. It's not just sudden oak death syndrome. Um, we're bringing in all kinds of diseases or pests, like the emerald ash borer, that are just transforming our our forests. Uh, of course, the chestnut blight already already did that, and our standard response has been, "Okay, don't plant those anymore." That's what I want to talk about. We need, we're going to get past these diseases by finding resistance in our native genotypes. It'll only be a, a small percentage of the trees that will have some resistance, but we need to find them. And the way to do that is to plant more than ever now, not to stop planting them. Many will die, it's true, but the ones that don't die will be the future. So bacterial leaf scorch in my property, I've got a couple, couple dead red oaks at this point, several sick pin oaks, but there's others that are totally healthy. Those are gonna be the future. And by the way, the Jays are helping us with that because those are the acorns that they disperse, not the sick ones. Um, so please don't stop planting oaks. Um, yes, oak will, you know, as far as I know, there's no, no solution to it, uh, but um, keep planting and let's find the ones that can deal with it. That's what's gonna be the future. Yeah, and I would just add, be very skeptical if some tree care person comes along and says, oh, I can treat that. Um, because even if it's a drench, it's going to kill other things. Um, there were other questions. Uh, oh, uh, I think here's a, a speaking of foreign invaders, something about oaks and jumping worms. Uh, maybe oh, yeah. you can elaborate on that. Yeah. Uh, of course, everywhere the glaciers were, uh, it totally eliminated the worm, worm species in North America south of, of uh, actually several hundred miles south of where the glaciers were, there were some uh, uh, worms that survived. So for example, in, in Georgia, I think uh, worms were never eliminated. But in, in northern parts, the worms we have here have all been brought over from Europe or someplace else. Uh, for, we, we've been here since the 1600s and for, for you know 400 years, those worms have played pretty nice. They've aerated our soil and the birds eat them and it has not been a disaster. But recently, we brought over at least four species of uh, worms from China. Um, the small little reddish things, that, they're called jumping worms because you pound on the soil and they come jumping out like, like crazy men. Um, they're not playing nice. They eat all the leaf litter. They, they uh, change the chemistry of the soil. They eat all the seeds in the soil and they leave it just bare soil, which erodes. Um, and for some reason, the birds, the birds don't eat them. They don't like them. I don't know. But um, 
And I've talked to, there's several people that have worked on worms that very hard to work on. Anything that's in the soil is hard to work on. So there's not very, not a lot of people working on it, but how do you control these? Nobody knows. But um, once one common theme from the people I talked to is that uh, they don't like oak leaf litter. So those oaks are, oak leaves are tough and, and they last a long time and the worms just don't eat very many of them. Uh, so when you have a healthy amount of oak leaf litter in your, your forest, those worms are, are not penetrating those forests uh, to the extent that they do the other things. They love maple, they love birches, they love tulip trees, they just wipe them out. Uh, so that's another reason to get the oak density in our forest back, back up. Okay, thank you. Um, here's, here's kind of a, does anyone know? question and does anyone know why oaks support about uh, to a ratio of 10 to 1 moss species over butterflies? Yeah that's a good question. Uh, there are about five hypotheses why that is um, and one of them would be I'll just rattle them off. Oaks, oaks have a lot of species and they have a huge range so they have been exposed to caterpillar populations over a much broader range than many other trees. They're also very old so they've, there's been a lot of time for caterpillars to adapt to oak defenses. Probably the most important one though is um, the way oaks defend themselves. They defend themselves with a quantitative defense called tannins as opposed to a qualitative defense, which is poisonous. Um, so when, when something eats an oak leaf, it doesn't, it's not poisoned. Tannins uh, slow the absorption of protein. It makes it hard to eat. Uh, but caterpillars, many caterpillars have figured out how to get past tannins by changing the pH of their gut. Uh, so it, it turns out that oak defenses are just not all that effective. And there's a lot of things that have been able to adapt to tannins and, and get around the oak defenses, as opposed to getting around cyanide that are, it's in a lot of uh, plants um, or, or nicotine or, you know, or the, the, the toxins that are in solanaceous plants. Those are tough for, for a lot of caterpillars to eat. Um, and then the final thing is oaks are really apparent. A single tree can be in the landscape for hundreds of years. So it's a lot of time for, for the local population of, of uh, caterpillars to adapt to the, that particular tree, as opposed to something like a spring beauty, which is around for two weeks in the, in the spring and then it's gone. So not much time for, for the interaction between the caterpillars and the plant. Um, you put all those together, again, those are not mutually exclusive hypotheses. And, probably explains it. Okay, um, I'm sorry, folks. I'm gonna cut and kind of pick through some of the questions that came in tonight. Uh, one of them was saying, please, so I don't uh, recommend you do this, but um, if you coppice a red oak, will it still produce acorns? I think there's a oh. lot of fascination about that concept of coppicing. Yeah. I don't think so. You need, okay. you need mature tissue to, to get reproduction. And people say, when does that happen? Um, it's uh, the very first acorns will start to happen maybe when it's 17, 18 years old, but the older it gets, the more acorns it, it makes. So, you know, a 20 year old tree starts to get going, but it doesn't happen right away. Okay, I just saw an interesting one because I love to talk about um, the bigger issue of pesticides. Does the treatment of chinch bugs, grubs, and so forth from lawn companies injure oaks and maple trees? Gee, that, you know, that is a great question. And I don't know how deep that stuff goes. Um, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked that before uh, for me. And, and um... you're you're depriving some of the wasp predators of food by killing the grubs. That's one. Well, you're certainly hurting the birds doing that. Yeah. But um, does it hurt the tree itself? Not sure. I guess it depends on the dose and how much you put down there. Don't know. Yeah. I guess the bottom line is hesitate when you use poison. Um, because well, you know, there, there are times when there's no, uh, when there's no alternative, but <clears throat> most of the times there is an alternative. Um, I, there, here's a one that I, I thought was interesting. I'm sorry, folks, again. Um, if you use your lawnmower over the leaves, but you're leaving them, is that okay? Uh, well, you're chopping the, the leaves up. 
Um, right. So, so let's say you have uh, that. Let's say your polyphemus cocoon fell off its branch and it's laying on the ground. It's not going to survive a lawnmower. <laughs> Uh, and if you look closely at a lot of the oak leaves that are on the ground, the little leaf, the corners of the leaves are curled over. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of pe pupae of smaller moths that are in those, those leaves. And a lot of uh, caterpillars drop from the tree and actually spin a cocoon among the, the leaf litter. Very tough to, to see. Um, so all of that stuff would be destroyed. Now there's many more caterpillars that actually tunnel underground and they're pupating in the ground. And they would not be disturbed that way. But I know people like to chop up their leaves because it, they look better and they don't blow away as easily. But you know, once leaf leaf litter gets wet, it typically doesn't doesn't blow away. My son bought a a house uh, a couple of years ago, and the first fall he called me up and said, "He said, Dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with the leaves?" I said, "Put them in your flower beds." And he said, "I don't have enough flower beds." I said, "Exactly." That's how you shrink the lawn, and that's where you put the, the leaves. Um, so, uh, let's see now. There's there's just tons and tons of questions. Um, one of them, I'm getting away from folks a little bit. How is the homegrown national park project going? A lot of people were wondering. Uh, good. Thanks for asking. Yeah, please join homegrown national park. Um, we got a, almost 1,100 people so far. Um, this is a, this is our, our social media attempt to unite all of the. Uh, we've got a lot of like-minded groups out there. We've got Wild Ones. We've got Audubon. We've got National Wildlife Federation. They're all competing for members. Homegrown National Park is not competing for any membership because it doesn't cost anything. It just wants to unite these group in the common goal of converting at least 20 million acres of of lawn, cut the area of lawn in half into viable habitat or if you have if you're protecting an area on your your property that counts um, and and then it will light up on the map we talk about getting on the map so we can see connectivity build we can see conservation happening in north america right before our eyes and that is supposedly will will you know and uh, influence people who aren't thinking about this uh, to actually join in I've been talking about this stuff for, I don't know, 15 years now, for sure. And I, I, I literally have reached tens of thousands of people, but I got to reach tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions for this to be really effective. Everybody's got to do that. So we've got to reach beyond the choir. And that's what Homegrown National Park is designed to do. All right. And I'm going to just uh, thank you for all your time. But one more question, because I, I'm curious. Uh, do you offer summer internships for teachers? Because I think we really need to give teachers the tools um, to help them teach this yeah. message. Yeah, you know, there used to be a program at the University of Delaware exactly for teachers uh, back in the 80s. And I did it several times, but apparently that's dissolved. Um, uh, you know, teachers typically have to have some kind of summer salary. Money's really short. I don't have money for grad students. I said, get your grad students to do it. Grad student costs 30,000 a year that I've got to come up with. Um, the, a, a summer program for teachers would be great. But you know, when I do these, these webinars, I'm telling you everything I know. Listen to a couple of them and, and that's it. I don't know anything else. So <laughs> it doesn't take a whole summer worth of exposure to, to learn what I know or read, read the books, but... Um, that's good. We ought to have programs like that because you're right. The teachers have to be teaching the kids. So, um, well, I'm I'm going to um, let you off the hook here and and thank you again. Uh, like I said, I I think we all, even if we've gone through your programs before, we always pick up something new. And I and I want to again apologize to everyone who sent in questions before. Um, I forward them to Dr. Tallamy. I went through some of them. Some of them just couldn't be answered. Um, look in the uh, chat. Uh, there were some links provided about questions about best oak species for certain areas and situations. So, and we can't solve oak wilt. Don't move firewood. That's a big part of it. Good advice. Good advice. <laughs> All right, uh, I got a few closing remarks. So um, 
you are free to move around the country now, Dr. Tallamy. Okay. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Um, again, let me pull up my... All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye. Bye, Sally. Yes, Thanks. bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Okay, there we go. All right, that's um, obviously what you just uh, participated in. Um, I'm just going to say to learn more about wild ones. Here's a map showing. Uh, current seedlings and chapters. We're always happy to support more activity. Um, learn more about wild ones um, by um, checking out our award-winning quarterly journal that highlights wild ones programs and member requested articles about native plants. Um, the journal also provides uh, information about various nurseries, native plant nurseries around the country. And we want to certainly promote uh, more and more supply of native plants. Um, okay, well, and uh, we have some upcoming seminars or webinars. Uh, again, they're open for, uh, so check for information on various social media. And if you are getting the newsletter, you've probably already seen that we have Heather Holm uh, coming up October 20th, talking about wasps their biology, diversity, and role as beneficial insects and pollinators of native plants. Um, Heather, you might have seen her program last summer. She's an honorary director, and she's written a, a number of excellent um, books on pollinators, bees, and so forth. Uh, we have Larry Weiner coming up in November, and, um, and uh, we have uh, Matthew Ross in January when we're all dreaming about beautiful gardens to talk about Americans' public gardens. Uh, for you educators, or uh, we are, have extended the deadline for the Laureato Seeds of Education Grant Program. Um, the applications can be submitted through November 6th. So go to the website and get more information about it. That's a great way to uh, extend native plant gardens and otherwise lawn and parking lots that surround schools. And get social. Um, here are some links if you're not familiar with uh, various social media, um, the social media presence we have. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to stay informed and to network with other native plant um, aficionados. And consider joining Wild Ones. Um, we are nearly 6,000 members in, like I said, 73 chapters and seedlings across 21 states. So there's the membership link for you. And again, if you don't have a chapter near you, consider starting one. Thank you again for attending, and I hope. You have a wonderful evening.